ինչույն բոլորի մեր երկրորդ բանախոսությունն է այսօր Ստեֆան Քրիստենսենի այսօր կխոսեն Ստեֆանը քաղաքականության եւ երևութաբանության երևութաբանության տեսակետից քաղաքականության մասին իզակետում ունենալով Institutioni, cam himnar cuțan, cam hasta cuțan, concepte, voi voros ce a fost în grad de a avea 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 fost Riscă. Riscă verțele, are riscă. Și pe scurt, scurt, scurt. So, it's really, it's a great pleasure to, to, to be here and to be able to, to present some aspects of phenomenological thinking. And I hope that today you, you will be, I'll be able to show you in what sense uh, phenomenological thinking might be relevant to politics and particularly to the current political situation here in this country. So to, two days ago I, I made a short introduction to phenomenology, in particular attempting to show the originality of Maurice Merleau-Ponty's conception. For those who were not here the other day, Merleau-Ponty is the, is the guy on the left. In this drawing, he's uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir, and uh, Albert Camus, the, the foremost, well, best known figures of French so called existentialism, or rather, philosophy of, ex of existence. Um, the way they look on this picture might be around in the 50s, probably. So it fits quite well to the period on. I'm going to be talking about uh, at least the, 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 the moment where the text I'm talking about were written. So um, today my topic is more political. I will show how phenomenology may become political and at what sort of politics a phenomenological approach may inspire. The challenge here is first how to, how to ask the question of the collective in a method that takes the individual subject's perspective as its point of departure. That's the first part of my talk, where, which is more problematic, a little more methodological in a sense. Um, uh, and, but, how, but the main purpose of this talk, however, is to think about how political change happens. That's the main target of what I'm going to talk about. Um, that political change is not just a change of names of those in power, but a real change in the way power is used and experienced. A real change in the habits and expectations towards the existing institutions, and one could also add a real change in the way the institutions work. The administrations, the parliament, you know, all the institutions that make up the structure of the, of the state and all the power relations in, in society. Okay, so. But I'm going to just start with some more methodological or yeah, systematic questions about how uh, you can ask uh, the question of the political in the phenomenological framework. <clears throat> One of the difficulties in phenomenological thinking is to introduce the question of the collective. To go from the first person singular, the ego, to the first person plural, the we. Since phenomenology is a practice describing experience, and since experience is necessarily in the first person, it's the experience of one subject at a time, uh, the perspective is always, or at least as a point of departure, the uh, perspective is the individual's perspective. Every subject's perspective is singular, and as such, irreplaceable. On the other hand, as I have shown the other day, the other is always already present in the most intimate movements of my own body. 
Um, yeah, I, I thought about when I, I read the paper again uh, this morning, I thought about another uh, working note, <coughs> the visible and the invisible. So the manuscript that were found in Merleau-Ponty's uh, uh, office after his death in 61, where um, he writes the following, and just, just uh, adding this, to, because I, I like this passage very much, and it says a lot about the way the other is present, uh, just in, uh, implicitly. Uh, Merleau-Ponty writes in this working note, quote, one feels oneself looked at, and then he adds in a uh, parenthesis, parenthesis. parenthesis, burning neck, not because something passes from the look to our body to burn it at the point seen, but because to feel one's body is also to feel its aspects for the other. I explained this aspect the other day. But I think the, this experience of the burning neck, you know, when you feel someone looks at you from behind, this is particular, particularly um, an experience by, uh, made by women, I think, particularly in a, in a, in a patriarchal uh, society. But of course, it can be made also by men, and um, so this is the, the this is this feel. It's not, of course, to be understood literally as if uh, the gaze of the other were uh, warming your neck, you know, <laughs> like uh, in that sense. But it's um, it's it's something. It's just it expresses the idea, the, no, the experience that to feel one's own body is also to feel its aspect for the other. Yeah, to you can really feel very in a very strange and and very yeah, compl complex way, the, that the other has a certain sort of gaze on you, on your body. A desiring gaze or a repulsive gaze or whatever. Kind of, you know, it, this, this is always present. Okay. So we have a paradox or a tension between the individual subject's perspective considered as irreducible and the collective always already embodied in the individual. But one could say that we never really access the collective perspective because all we really have access to um, is the other, as each of us imagines. Husserl, so coming back to the founder of phenomenology, to, to make you see the difficulty in the phenomenological method, in the Cartesian Meditations from 1928, Husserl, uh, confronts the objection of solipsism. That is the objection that his philosophy does not accommodate the presence of other egos. That since the, the world is disclosed for a consciousness, that everything that has a meaning, has a meaning in the framework of a transcendental, consci transcendental consciousness, and so there's absolutely no way to be uh, sure that the other as, as another really exists, because that's only the other as I see him, as I perceive him, as I think of him or her. <coughs> um, so sin yeah, since the phenomenological epoche or reduction reduced everything to a part of my consciousness and everything that I experience is a part of my transcendental consciousness, so the... Uh, yeah, this sentence was not really... <laughs> was not finished in my manuscript. Sorry about this, Martha. Um, so since this reduced everything to, to a part of my consciousness, then the other, uh, logically, is not the other as such, but the other as I see him. So already appropriated by my elaborations or by my perceptions. The other, but Husserl says that the other egos are presented to me nevertheless, not as simple representations in me, but as other subjects able to present the world. So but the answer of Husserl is, okay, yes, I'm always, already, I'm always in the flow of my consciousness, but what I perceive among many other things is other persons that themselves has also, have also have flows of consciousness. And I perceive them as such. I, don't, I clearly per, do not perceive Vartan as... Uh, in this, uh, as a se same sort of being as this, you know, without water or with water, uh, this thing, yeah? Because I per perceive him also as, as a center of his world, as another ego, in other terms, yeah? 
Um, yeah, I perceive the others both as objects, as bodies, in the world, but also as subjects, as subjects perceiving themselves in the world, and perceiving the same world as I. On my capacity to perceive the others as other subjects, it depends the very constitution of the social world and the constitution of objectivity in Husserl's view. And then I have a small, short quote from the Cartesian meditation uh, from Husserl. So, the existence sense, or rather, the sense of existence, and the Seinsinn, the, the, the meaning of existence of the world and of nature in particular, as objective nature, includes, after all, as we have already mentioned, thereness for everyone. The fact that it is there for everyone. This is included in the, in the sense of being of nature. This is always co-intended wherever we speak of objective actuality. So in Husserl's strategy, there is first the stream of my consciousness, the transcendental ego. Then there is the perception of other subjects, the recognition that there are other transcendental egos in the world. Together with these other egos, I form the social world. And more importantly, I perceive the world as it is perceived by the others. I make, in my own name, the experience of the fact that the world is shared. This is then the foundation of culture and of the very idea of objectivity. In this sense, objectivity is the consequence of what Husserl calls intersubjectivity. This is very broadly, very simplified, the position of Husserl and quest the problem of the other in Husserl's uh, phenomenology. But as you probably have felt, there is an ambiguity since the point of departure is the flow of transcendental consciousness. On this question, uh, Merleau-Ponty, in my uh, view, adds something important. My perception of the other as another subject, as another ego perceiving the world, is not analogous to the perception of a thing. This is always already in Husserl. It is not just that I perceive different kinds of things in the, wo in the outside world, some of them being simple objects, others being subjects themselves, so, but when Merleau-Ponty thinks about the relations, of, the relation of two subjects, uh, he sh um, he shows, sorry, he shows that the other is actually already present in my very relation to my own body. He explains that there are at least four instances involved when I encounter the other, someone else. There is the I that I am, and there is the I that I that you see. And there, are, there is the you that you are, and there is the you that I see. Um, there is a quote from Paul Valéry, the French poet and theoretician, that Merleau-Ponty makes quite a few times throughout his works, which is from the book uh, Tel Quel, from 42, of uh, Paul Valéry, where the poet reflects on the situation of the encounter with others. This is a famous quote by Paul Valéry, that Merleau-Ponty quotes a lot of times, and here it is. As soon as gazes met, sorry, as soon as gazes meet, we are no longer wholly two, and it is hard to remain alone. This exchange, the term is exact, realizes in a very short time a transposition or meta metathesis, a chiasma of two destinies, two points of view thereby a sort of simultaneous reciprocal limitation occurs. You capture my image, my appearance. I capture yours. You are not me since you see me and I do not see myself. And what I lack is this me that you see. And what you lack is the you I see. This, in this structure of a dynamic X, this is the... Um, why uh, Valéry talks about the chiasma. And this, uh, Merleau-Ponty uses very much the idea, the, he takes it into French and says the chiasma comes from the Greek letter chi, which is an X, yeah, like in Russian, of course. Um, 
the, so in this structure of a dynamic X or uh, chi, the two instances of the first person of the ego are distributed on the ego and the other. But we still have a primacy of the ego and of the I U situation, where the third necessary instance for the social world is still absent. This is a, a limitation of you know, Ponty's approach. Because you still have only I and you. Where is the third? Where is society? So the question is whether there is a phenomenological experience of the social as such and not be satisfied with the constitution of the social from the perspective of the individual subject perceiving other individual subjects themselves perceiving the world. The answer to this question is actually yes, I would say, and um, this will allow me to introduce the notion of institution that I've already talked about a bit the other day. <coughs> Merleau-Ponty has actually um, another strategy than the chiasm and the I-U interaction. Um, this strategy is at the heart of his interest, a uh, strategy for introducing the question of the social and political, obviously. Uh, this strategy is at the heart of his interest for the phenomenon of language, for example. He was actually uh, the first philosopher to take seriously the teaching of Ferdinand de Saussure, the founder of structural linguistics, long before Derrida and the so-called post-structuralists, even before he himself discovered Saussure in the early 50s, he developed a fundamental distinction in the philosophy of language to be found in a central chapter of his Phenomenology of Perception, the distinction of speaking speech and spoken speech. Parole parlée, parole parlante, parole parlée. I will briefly explain how this distinction helps to describe the phenomenological experience of the social world as such. So, in the chapter of the phenomenology with the title The Body as Expression and Speech, Le corps comme expression et la parole, he uses the fundamental distinction between langage as constituted system of vocabulary and syntax, and speech, parole, as the acts through which this system is established. In the context of this distinction, there are two different notions of speech. The speech simply reproducing the existing system, that he calls spoken speech, and the speech introducing a change, producing the system of language, that he calls speaking speech. Um, so, they're actually, I'm just adding this remark, I'm, actually spoken speech and speaking speech are always mixed up in the way you speak. Some people are only talking like every other t talk, so their, their way of talking is much more spoken speech. And some people are talking a bit strange, or, you know, writers might perhaps be like those people writing in a using words systematically in a slightly different way as ordinary as the society in general uses them so they will be more systematically using a kind of speaking so the speaking subject encounters the collective and the social once he or she uses the inherited meaning structures and by talking in a more or less creative manner uh, then he or she introduces changes in the system. Of course, of course, um, it's not enough just for one individual to talk a bit differently than the others to make the system change. The others have to take up the changes in order for the system to change. So, Merleau-Ponty, for example, writes in this chapter of the Phenomenology, the phonetic gesture realizes for the speaking subject and for those who listen to him or her a certain structuration of experience, a certain modulation of existence, exactly in the same way as the behavior of my body invests for me and for the other the object surrounding me with a certain meaning. So, this is, he works often with this analogy between perceptual habits and language. This gesture of speech presupposes a common world perceived by all, 
Otherwise, it would not be make, it wouldn't make sense to speak to the others. But it's not enough to explain the phenomenology, the, sorry, the phenomenon of language. The existing meanings have been new in the past. This is the sense of the notion of speaking, speaking speech, to capture the moment when a different way of using a word is uttered and taken up by others. So this is what he calls the essential power of speech. Pouvoir essentiel de la parole. When the act of talking goes beyond the existing, condi the existing conditions of sense making. Um, in his lecture at the Collège de France in the 1950s, so th this was from the 40s, in the 1950s, Merleau-Ponty takes this emergence of new meanings up again, along with the notion of institution. In um, 1945, in Phenomenology of Perception, he simply introduced the distinction of spoken speech and speaking speech, but didn't show how the process of speaking speech actually works. How a new meaning actually becomes instituted in language. So how the body of language actually changes. Um, and also what the position and action of the subject is in the process. This is a peculiar mixing of active and passive aspects. You have to consciously try something new, but then what emerges goes beyond what you anticipated. Moreover, when the new meaning is established, when it is instituted, it tends to appear as if it was as if it had always already been there. My attempt now will be to explain these two strange phenomena in the political realm. This implies to describe the moment of activity and the moment of passivity, of letting the change be, and the articulation, articulation of these two moments. But, um, okay, then there is another aspect, the quite yeah, nearly metaphysical question of the temporality of institution, this, this idea that I just said that actually once the institution has, <coughs> has happened, for example in the realm of science, when the solution to a mathematical problem has, has been discovered, so to speak, then it strangely appears as if it had always already been there, although it's a discovery, it's an elaboration. For example, when uh, um, yeah, when when um, yeah, you can talk about when some kind of fundamental geometrical law uh, has, for, about the triangle, for example, has been discovered by the ancient Greeks. Then it's not possible to look at a triangle the same way they did it before. It's like retroprojected in the past. This this new understanding. Of that's very fascinating, but that's a very difficult question also. I will concentrate on the position of the subject and the interplay with the collective. So to think about the process of institution in the political realm means to question habits and power relations. How do power relations and habits work ordinarily in a given society? In Armenia, for example, and you will probably perhaps correct me, I'm taking a huge risk here. <laughs> Um, the power relations are generally mediated by social structures such as unions, political parties or administrations. Uh, sorry, our power relations are rarely mediated. Rarely. Yeah, that was prudent. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, this was... Power relations are rarely mediated by social structures such as unions, political parties, or administrations. Power relations are generally personal relations. Before the revolution, you would vote for someone in the expectation that he protected you. I say he because it generally meant. You had received a little money in order to vote for someone, perhaps. And this also meant symbolically that you placed yourself under his protection. So this type of system is called cronism in English, clientelism in French. But what I, what I want to stress here is not the particular ism, it is the fact that it means the absence of collective mediations. In other more older systems, for example in 
Switzerland. Social power relations are heavily mediated by a whole series of existing structures and norms of behavior that have been shaped in the course of the generations. These structures are built into the expectations and habits of people. For example, when they are candidates in an election, when they ask the administration for something, when they campaign for something, etc. In such cases, there, are, there is a spectrum of possible modes of behaviors that are filtered by the given structures. This, um, of course, does not mean that the behavior is entirely determined. It is always possible to introduce modifications into one's behavior, but these modifications into one's into the expectations, for example. Yeah. But these modifications are necessarily on the basis of the existing structures. Um, just to to give you an example of what happens right now in Geneva, and that a, a very very actual political problem that we had that is exactly related to what I'm ta talking about. Actually, in Switzerland and in Geneva, we have no procedures for removing uh, um, a, a political uh, servant. For example, a member of the executive of the canton of Geneva, a member of the local government, there is no procedure to remove him from power if he makes something. In, in other countries, you have this sort of, you know, impeachment procedure or something like that. Because it is quite normal, and it has been the case in the last, twin, in the last 50 years, that when a member of the government um, is responsible for a scandal or for something not right, I mean, whatever happens, there was, a, for example, an example of, of one member of the government in Geneva a few years ago who had a... Um, what was it exactly? Um, he was in a in a nightclub and he had a fighting with uh, with a guy at the nightclub and then he tried to cover it up and whatever. It was not really a big deal. I mean, as such, you would say, okay, so what? But since he tried to cover it up and it went out in the press and he got embarrassed and he had no other choice to step down, to resign. But now. We have the case of a member of the government who was the best elected member of the government in the last elections in the spring. Actually, he was elected in the first term with over 50% of the vote. And just a few weeks after the election, we discovered that he had, he had been invited to Abu Dhabi by a rich friend. Uh, and first he said it was a private meeting, and then it was discovered that it actually was not private at all, that he had met the sheikh and various other figures and whatever. He had not just been with his family to watch the, the Formula, One, Formula One Grand Prix, and so... And then the, the justice opened a procedure against him, because it's normally it's, um, um, it's forbidden to accept an advantage. It's not just in, uh, forbidden to be corrupt, it's also forbidden to accept an advantage in the, in, in the framework of your, of your function. But he didn't resign. He doesn't want to resign. He's still there. And so we have a political crisis. Because it's, it's, against, it's against the habits of, uh, that we have in, in, in Geneva. So there's a tension there. Everyone is stressed about this. There's a polemic going on there. And so, it might seem ridiculous to you, perhaps. Uh, but it's to illustrate the fact that politics is made of expectations and types of behavior. When something ha when you're in a, you have a political responsibility, you're a member of the government, and, the, and then if there's a scandal, if so, one of your of the services that you are responsible for, one of the departments, or whatever, something happens if you have problems with justice, then you're supposed to resign. Is this the first time? That's yeah, it's the first. It has a member of the government in Geneva has never been. Uh, how do you say? Um, um, he he's accused by the by by the. By, the, by justice, and there's going to be a court case. Indicted. The, indicted, sorry, thank you, thank you. He's indicted. And he and the parliament was convened for one month ago, the local parliament in Geneva, and removed his immunity. 
So it's it's it, it is really it is really serious. It's the first time in history it happens. Such a such a thing happens because all that every time when something someone like that this would be indicted, he would have resigned way before. So okay, this is just to not to yeah. You might be interested in local politics in Geneva if you want. But anyway, it's just to explain that there is a set of expected behaviors according to which position you're in. But there are always modifications that are possible. And uh, in, in a positive sense and of course also in a negative, in a negative way. And each modification makes the whole structure change in various degrees. Just as our use of language is based on the semantic and syntactic resources that we inherit and on our capacity to introduce changes in those inherited structures, we must keep in mind that the issue at stake is the transformation or the evolution of modes of behavior and expectations toward the behavior of others in society. Perhaps I'll bring in some concrete examples. The current phase in Armenian political life is very rich and absolutely fascinating. On the one hand, we have witnessed a significant change in the political, political repertoire made by Nikol Pashinyan and his movement and all other people around him uh, during the events in April earlier this year. This change was described to me by Momik um, in uh, Vartanyan in details and I thank him for that. Uh, in the local political tradition, uh, as far as I have heard, we would have a leader, like Levon, uh, usually named by his first name, Levon, Rafi, uh, Robert, whoever, speaking to the crowd and hoping to lead the crowd into the place of power and replace the oligarch in chief. We had Levon speaking to the crowd at the Matinadaran or the Opera Square, and in the early stages of the revolution, when Nigol had just come back from his trekking in the north of the country, we, he would speak each evening on a square before his followers. A few thousand people would gather in the early days of March and April, earlier this year. And this repetition was already a sign of fatigue. As Momik recalled, or as Momik told us, the crowd began to reduce quite quickly in these first days. Probably because this setting recalled the previous failures to bring political change. Um, it recalled the failure of Rafi of Venetian five years before. It recalled the repression of March 2008 and all the previous similar events. The change then introduced by Nigol was decisive. Instead of repeating the evening speech and instead of seeing the crowd reduce, he told the people to come by themselves and organize by themselves autonomously. This gesture introduced a profound change, barely visible since Nigol speaks very much, and there is a risk that it can be forgotten since we sense that many things in the current political developments depend on this one little man. From the philosophical point of view, Nigol's gesture is fascinating. He seems to have understood that change, he and probably the whole group around him, uh, seems to have understood that change could only come if the leading subject retired, not completely of course, still pulling some strings, still giving instructions here and there, but still retiring to some extent. Um, enough to leave a space for a new structure and a new form of political behavior to emerge. To emerge. This intriguing paradox is described a few times in the works of Merle Bonti, first already in the Phenomenology and then in the writings about language in the early 50s and in the lecture of 54-55 about institution. The essential observation is that the subject must both be actively anticipating the possible changes in the system, but also retire in order to let the change happen in its full sense. About the emergence of new meanings in language, for example, Merleau-Ponty writes in a manuscript in, uh, entitled The Prose of the World in the early 50s, 
how can we understand this productive moment of language that transforms a hazard in reason and on the basis of an old disappearing way of speaking makes a new one more efficient, more expressive, just like the ebb of the sea after a wave makes the next wave bigger. A metaphorical way of expressing the, the idea. Yeah? A retreat um, that gives way, that gives space for something different. Or, as he writes in the institution lecture, yet a new quote, there is an emptiness about the writer, again, and this is really the model. Uh, one of the great models is, is this uh, phenomenology of writing, of writing novels particularly, when, because he, he wrote a lot about Proust particularly, and uh, the way that, that the Recherche du Temps Perdu actually emerges out of uh, renouncement by Proust. He wanted to write something, as long as he wanted to write something, it, he didn't get it, but when he renounced to some extent his initial project, then the actual work emerged. Okay, as Merle Bonti writes in the institution lecture, quote, there is an emptiness in the writer or the painter prior to beginning. It is by writing and painting that one discovers. In so far as the book advances, we discover things that are consonant. The image of a retreat opening a space and making the next gesture even bigger is significant. Any act of creation supposes such a movement of ebb and flow. Just like Nigol retreated in order to let the political flow grow, the writer, for example, tries a new way of using a word and then retires to see how it works in his text or her text and how this new use is taken up by other writers and by the speakers in society. And the same for the painter, or the dancer, or the political activist. The very fact that such a gesture opens up new possibilities, that a genuine work of art opens a horizon of possible research, implies that the author lets his creation, or her creation, be appropriated by others. So before I conclude about, with the ideas of Merleau-Ponty about the revolution as the self-contesting of power. I'll just stress two aspects that I've talked about. The first aspect is the role of the individual in a structural social change and the mix of activity and passivity, of activism and letting be, that is necessary in, in order to, for a new structure to emerge. The second aspect is a reflection about the very nature of the political institutions as they are based on and are constituted by a set of behavior patterns and expectations. This second aspect we can keep for the discussion. The idea here is an embodied theory of the political structures where the claim is that the dynamic institution of a political procedure or a decision center is a question of collective motility and perception. From this point of view, we can interpret the political field as a set of possible behaviors and perceptions, where some styles of behaviors are dominant and others not. Some styles of behavior are more favorable for social development and others not. And the change in the style of behavior of one group can be appropriated by the whole and bring a change to the very style of government, as we are apparently witnessing right now. And now I come to a conclusion. Um, this implies to rethink the phenomenon of power based on the claim that every human life is embodied and embedded in a historical and social situation, which means that it is involved in a complex <coughs> web of power relations. And it implies to, in this uh, direction, to uh, then always try to understand singularly in this particular society what those power relations are made of. Because it's in each setting, in each society, according to the history of this particular society, the, these power, this web of power relation has a different shape. The danger of most revolutions is that they have induced a blind confidence in dialectic power of its accomplishments. The logic of the revolution justifies a radicality in the political steps taken. We have to get 
to the end of the revolution. Yeah. This is a very common temptation in such a climate. There is an object, sort of, there is an objectivity of the revolution commanding certain steps to the individuals that only have the choice to join or to disappear. The revolutionary subjectivity, for example, has been in the 20th century the proletarian. If we think back in the, I don't know, um, of course, the perspective I'm, go I'm, I'm taking now here, um, talking about Merleau-Ponty, it's, it's perhaps a particular effort for you, of course, with the Soviet history, because it's seen from the other side of, of the Iron Curtain. Um, as you know, Merleau-Ponty was um, close to political movements that were um, yeah, sympathetic to communist revolution, but he himself was very, very critical against communist party so he, he has this very complex relation to, to this so when I, when I write that the revolutionary subjectivity has been in the 20th century the proletarian you can think about yeah really some mainstream political thinking in Western Europe in the uh, post-war period for example. but before that of course Soviet Union and in the 20s, for example. Okay, whatever. You can come back to that. The choice given to the revolutionary subject then, according to this rigid and deterministic conception, was to substitute his or her subjectivity to the one of the proletarian, since the proletarian was the bearer of the becoming of the society. Against this idea defended by Sartre in the beginning of the 50s, Merleau-Ponty formulates this idea, his idea about the permanent revolution. In the notes for his lecture on passivity, which on the same year of, as the one on institution, that's in 55. The passivity lecture starts with a discussion of Sartre's political ideas, and that's maybe because this lecture was just a few months after the two old friends split and Merleau-Ponty quit the editorial board of the journal that they had founded together with Simone de Beauvoir, Le Temps Moderne. And so here is the quote uh, that he brings in this discussion of Sartre's ideas. Uh, so he criticizes, sorry, just one more remark before the quote. The, what he, he criticizes in Sartre is this binary logic. Either you are with the proletarian and your subjectivity as an intellectual was, must sort of yeah, identify with the proletarian, which is the, the, the subjectivity bearing the hopes for a revolution, or you are, you are out. And um, so this is a binary dialect. And, um, <coughs> Merleau-Ponty criticizes this, and then you stumble on this sentence, and um, here it is. The dialectic requires permanent revolution, that is, the self-contesting of power, which therefore should not be considered as an absolute and should be liberal." End quote. Um, just to remark about the term liberal, <laughs> it means liberal in the philosophical sense, uh, not of course in the economical sense. It's nothing to do with uh, neoliberalism as we conceive it now, just to, to avoid any misunderstanding. <laughs> but liberal really in the sense of each individual being able to, yeah, in the sense of yeah, human rights, being capacity to organize, to create an organization, to express yourself, etc. And the essential idea here is permanent revolution is the self-contesting of power. That's the very powerful claim, in my view. So, I'll conclude the, my speech with a comment on this idea and show how, or attempt to show how a system of direct democracy is the best, or might be a good way to satisfy this criterion of a permanent revolution. If the sub subject is always already embedded in its society, in the collective history, 
if the subject's freedom is in the way he or she appropriates his heritage. So where is the possibility of a revolution? Just as the subject can only be in a movement of back and forth between activity and passivity, the revolution cannot be accomplished. Because this would mean that the real existing subjects become entirely passive in front of the accomplishment of a collective history. For example, in the form of the dictatorship of the proletariat. So it has to be permanent in order that the individuals or the groups in society keep moving. But this doesn't entail a state of political turmoil. It means that we have to put in place institutions, in the classical sense of the word, that have the function of contesting power, enabling society to remain in a state of constant evolution. And um, how that direct democracy can be a way of doing this, uh, we can discuss now or tomorrow evening at uh, Studio 20. <laughs> and uh, for now, I thank you very much for the attention and I look forward to your questions or remarks. Can you watch a continuous chat? Yes, because I will have a link. Բանարվեջ, որ Սարտրի է բանի միջև, պրոլիտարյատ արդյոք ներկայասնում է թե չէ, թե այդ կաղաքական այդ սուբեկտ անդրպետք է ձևի նորից։ It's very much a question of the relation of the intellectual with or to the proletarian subjectivity. If you think that <coughs> subjectivity, that uh, if you think that the individual subjectivity is um, is an access to the universal, and that one particular position, like the proletarian's subjectivity, is the way to um, realize a st stable situation in in history, then the intellectual must identify completely with. The proletarian. That would be very simply the idea of the idea of, of Sartre. And uh, what Merleau Ponty was thinking is that the indiv the individual subjectivity is always embedded, embodied in a situation, so it cannot never in it can never embody completely uh, the destination of history. And it's important to uh, to keep the society in movement. Uh, in order to 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 have it to to um, to make the development permanent. That's very simply. I I I think I, I don't want to get much more into the details of that because it supposes it's a quite a complex discussion because it really presupposes very much the ontological positions of both. Yeah. So, and so it's quite a long discussion to really be very, very clear until the bottom of this. Yeah. Yes, Sartre got up my way. Chin Shunako Matjok would incurate this pocket at this subject. Chimka. Yes, Sunaka Mary Hamama. Or wait, if you can ask Hanuma, Sartre and Janak Stalin is there. Is what Sunaka Mary Mawiste. <laughs> yeah, I think in, in, uh, in Sartre there is this idea that um, that you should come to a, to a conclusion in history. I'm very simplifying, very terribly, but there is this idea in, in Sartre that somehow uh, revolution should be a conclusion in history and the uh, and the establishment of a stable, clear and uh, just, uh, righteous uh, situation. And that history stops? And that history, well, at least that the dialectics 
of the servant and the master would stop because there would uh, finally be a situation of right righteousness in society. And in Mirabeau Ponty, there is the He's, he, he cannot admit this because in his ontology already is an ontology of the mixing, an ontology where it's not, as, as I try to explain, black about it's white. never black and white, and the other is always already present in the way I relate to myself, so there's no possibility of separation between me and, and the other. The proletarian, for example, in, in his, the worker uh, is... Uh, the worker's subjectivity is constituted also by its relation, his, his or her relations with the owner, with the entrepreneurs, and with other social cat categories. And uh, uh, so it's always much more complicated and mixed up in, in real life, in real society. And that Merle Ponty was very much focused on and wanted to give an account of all these phenomena of mixing in society. We would, didn't want, he didn't think that one subjectivity had a particular privileged access to the universal. Um, one way is to um, to just see an analogy. You know, there is a system of language, and there is a system of the political institutions, and then you took, take take either the one or the other as example and you see how change occur in the one and then you try to see how it can transfer to the other yeah that's one one way just just analogy but then um, of course uh, there is also a way that the particular writings of particular writers do have a political influence, a political, um, um, yeah, force uh, in, in society, and that's the, that's the other aspect. Um, now, in Merleau-Ponty's time, um, in France, the 40s and 50s, it was absolutely evident that writers or philosophers when they write, what they write have a political aspect or is engaged. No? Literature engagée was the, the evidence. They were actually in literature. It was the the main issue. You know, either you make l'art pour l'art and you tr try to make as if as if you could um, just relate to to history of art and be in your studio or in your office and just writing things that had no political relevance or or at, normally it did have what you were writing had had. An, but then, what Merleau-Ponty would say is that um, art in general, and literature in particular, has a political relevance when it makes you um, sen more sensitive, when it makes you perceive things in a, in a different way. This, and that's very political in a sense, because politics is also about perceiving. Perceiving ways of behavior as acceptable or as not acceptable. Perceiving, um, uh, perceiving social inequalities, perceiving, you know, just being, being aware of. And this sometimes requires, um, or most of the time, requires a particular sensitivity. And in order to, yeah, to develop such a sensitivity, you need art. 
And probably you need the different modality of that. You need literature for some kind of sensitivity. You need visual arts, you need cinema, you need installations for other kinds of... For Yeah, it's, it's all, all complementary. But it's not, it's not, you cannot really just program it and say, okay, we need literature for this aspect and we need a painting for that other aspect. In general, it's, it's a political relevance of art, uh, uh, particularly in, in the perspective of phenomenology, is because you need to develop your sensitivity, your capacity of perception. Uh, I want to ask about uh, direct democracy. Uh, you are living in a country which is the most, uh, in, which has the most, where direct democracy is most powerful in political system, and maybe you know that in Armenia also, um, Nikol Pashinyan often speaks about direct democracy, but uh, we are so different countries, and uh, I want to ask, uh, what are the peculiarities of Switzerland that make direct democracy there so strong and so powerful, uh, so uh, good functioning, and can this way, your, the way your direct democracy works, can, do you think it can work in Armenia also? And what shall we do? Yeah, okay. Switzerland is uh, not a unified country. Switzerland is a collection of 26, 26 small states. And the current system that we have was instituted, um, well, I'm not a specialist in Swiss history, but as far as I remember, it was uh, instituted after the Napoleon Wars and in particular after the 1840s about 170 years ago. In the 1840s, we had a civil war in Switzerland between the Protestant and the Catholic cantons. And in a, in a different canton, there was a, 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 a yeah, sort of a revolution, democratic revolution, particularly, for example, in Geneva in 1846, where the oligarchs of that time were pushed out of, because we had an oligarchic system in Geneva until then. And, um, and it became a sort of a, a, a bourgeois democracy, yeah? And from that time we have these, these tools of, of what we call semi-direct democracy. Not absolutely direct, but semi-direct. Why semi-direct? Because we still have elected bodies. There are parliaments at each level. But then there is a possibility for the people to oppose a law and to vote about a law voted by the particular parliament. So it's a, that's why it's called semi-direct, because there, there are parliaments voting laws. It's not only the people gathered in the village square, on the town square, raising the hands, you know. This, this happens, but only in the very small cantons of, of central and eastern Switzerland. Of course, if, if you're a larger society, you cannot practice that. You cannot have 200,000 people gathered in a square and voting, raising hands. That may, doesn't you know, you won't feel free in that way. How would you count the votes? And is it practically, practically impossible? Yeah. So I would say that this, the, the institutions of semi-direct democracy have shaped Switzerland as it is. It's not that Switzerland has introduced it. It's that it has shaped Switzerland as it has become it. Switzerland has become a stable country thanks to this system. Because, for example, when, just to give the, the, yeah, one of the essential aspects is the right of referendum. Referendum is when the parliament, for example, at the federal level, the parliament in Bern, adopts a new law. Okay? And then there is always a deadline, that's called the referendum deadline, um, and it's actually exactly four months, and in those four months you have the possibility of collecting 50,000 signatures. Every group of every citizen, every group, yeah, you can do it alone if you like, but it's better in a group, of course. Uh, every yeah, political party, workers' union, whatever group, whatever gathering, you can also, you and a few other citizens, although you, you are not, an, you're not already organized, you say, this, this law has to be voted by the people, I want to collect the signatures, so, so you can go and spend time on, on the squares uh, all over the country, speak to people and say, please come and sign this referendum because we want to have this law voted by the people. Hmm? So in this, you have these four months to collect 50,000 signatures. In, in Switzerland, there are, about, there are about 5 million voters, so it's not that much. 
it would be like as if here in, in Armenia, if it's as if you would have 20,000, something like that. Yeah, just about to give you a proportion. Yeah, and if you manage to collect these 50,000 signatures, then they are, of course, they are checked by the administration. Are, it's are they, uh, is it really citizens? You know, really uh, voting citizens that have signed, etc. It's, so they they really stupid um, men. And then it's if of course you'll have to to collect at least 10 percent more to be sure that you don't have fake signatures, etc. You know. And so they they uh, yeah they check it, and then they say okay now you the referendum has uh, has succeeded. And uh, so this law will be voted by the people. So it's a right, you know. So the state then is compelled to organize a popular vote. This means that if the government comes with a new proposal, you know, the, in order to minimize the risk of a referendum and not spend so much energy about, you know, convincing the people in a referendum campaign, you know, they have to check that the, the new law they want to propose to, to Parliament, they have to check among the people if, if it's okay. So that's why we have, before even the Parliament looks at the new proposal, the government makes a consultation among all the organizations that might be interested. If, it, if it's about in the environment, then they will, they will send it to all the interested NGOs, I don't know, the WWF, etc., etc., and they will give their opinion and normally the government should listen in order to prevent a, a future referendum afterwards after it has passed the parliament, you see? So the result of this is that the legislation is much more stable than in other countries because you, you don't have a majority you know, making a new law and then an election, a new majority, the new majority will be tempted to, to make their laws and so, so you have this kind of, of instability in other countries where it's only parliamentary. Yeah? And, um, and that has really made Switzerland the stable and prosperous country that it has become. It's the main reason why, it's of course there are other reasons, but since Switzerland is so stable, it has also been able to attract uh, such a, an amount of capital and whatever. Uh, all these less glorious things that you also know about. But actually, the system of direct democracy is a factor of stability. And of course, yes, it's, it's transferable to, to any country that has a liberal democratic culture. And it's, in my view, it's a powerful tool to build the democratic culture. It's not that you have to have a democratic culture and then you can have... If you think the Swiss people in the 1840s were such, demo, such a democratic people, you, you're, you're mistaken. You know? it, it, it was instituted because there was this conce conception about the people being the sovereign. But then, yeah, all sorts of populisms and errors and whatever violent uh, voting campaigns have happened all through the country. There are also many problems of this, of course, because since we have no legislation regulating the financing of voting campaigns, the financing of political parties, you can have one rich person putting lots of money into a voting campaign and influencing the people in that way. That's a problem, of course. Have some? It does, it does, of course it does. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the big problems that we have in Switzerland. So, so it's not at all perfect, but it, it is this factor. It really. On the one hand, it um, produces stability, and on the other hand, it makes the revolution permanent in the sense that it empowers people each year, because we, we vote four or five times a year on various questions. And, um, okay, sorry, the last aspect I really wanted to insist on, and I'm also going to talk about this tomorrow night, um, the initiative for having a vote, you know, who who is saying we will have a vote is never the government. And that's absolutely crucial. It's never the government who says, now we're going to vote on this. Look, look, like, for example, in Great Britain, suddenly the government says, the Prime Minister says, oh, we're going to have a vote about going out of the EU. Yeah? And then the people vote 
as much about the question as they vote for or against the government. So it's always ambiguous in that sense. But if, if it's the people who decide, now we want to oppose this law, or we want to propose something new in the Constitution, the initiative comes from, from below, from the people. That's absolutely essential. And I, yeah, it's, 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 I was so glad when I heard you go talking about this as a Swiss citizen. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. Then we can share experiences. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's an incredible how, how it makes the society strong. Even though we, don't, we have low participation generally in votes. We don't have a... Uh, yeah. Because if you vote every week. Yeah, if we vote <laughs> four or five times a, a year, of course, you can say, okay, I missed this one, I'll vote the next time. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Should I go to English? As you wish. Bastoretzi and Balte Vonsa, the Ravor Vum, Menki, Kam, Sotsalakani, Phenomenologia, Kam, Potsar Tsuna. I'm Gorsh, Yesi, and Galumakan, Yesis Gatso Tsu, and Tatuna, and I wish he's got so Tsuna, Master Heteretzi, Heto, he shouldn't work for Setsi, Nayev, Hasarakani, Sotsalakani, Phenomenologia, and Galman, Kam, Gatso Tsan, Masin, Himauzum, Haskana, HPS, and Katar, and Batsan. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps it was not clear enough. Yeah, I was talking about two two sorts of strategies in the phenomenological tradition to talk about the social. One strategy, which is used used uh, well, the yeah, used very much by Husserl and particularly in his Cartesian Meditations, was to take the point of the point of view of the ego and then how the ego encounters the other and how then inter through this intersubjective encounter there is this, uh, the objective social world emerging. The other uh, strategy as far as I can see is the, the one used by Naruponti when he for example talks about language or history um, and particularly when he talks about institution because in Merleau-Ponty's thinking, the idea of heritage is very important. Inherited structure, meaning structures, and so indirectly, when you when you work with inherited meaning structures, for example, as a writer or simply as a speaking subject, speaking to someone, then you indirectly have the experience of sociality because it is obviously the meaning structure used by the others, all the others. So the others are there in these the meaning. In, for example, yeah, in language or in your in your use of, of the political institutions or, you know. So um, that's, uh, that's another strategy that's complementary to the, to the other, to the one, uh, to the more transcendental classical Australian way of, of seeing this. Um, it doesn't really, if you take the transcendental point of view, it doesn't really solve the problem of solipsism in the sense, of course. It's just, you know, another kind of phenomenon, the phenomenon of history of, of language, for example, that makes you aware of the presence of, of others uh, in another way than just, you know, the intersubjective encounter, me and you. That's quite artificial. But the phenomenologists have spent a lot of time and energy about analyzing this, and it's still very much a debate in contemporary philosophy of mind and phenomenology, etc., to figure out, um, well, uh, this is known today as the problem of empathy. How do I know about the mental states, or the emotions of the other? But it's an artificial situation, because it's just me and you, and I... I look at you and I, how can I understand that you are perplexed or that you are sad or that you seem to be happy or whatever, yeah? How do I interpret the expressions of your face and so How do I access your my inner mind or whatever? Andrea Darnalov, Sartriyev, Merlo Ponti, Anavejin, Matavurakani, Ev, Kavakakan ne grava tutan Arabi tutan masi. 
արդյոք սարտրի դիրքորոշվման մեջ էական չի մարգսից է կող են համոզմունքը, որ կաղաքական գործողությունը հաղթահարում է պիլիսոպայությունը։ Իսկ Մերլոպոնդի մոտ արհարց են տարիս։ Արդյոք Մերլոպոնդի մտա դիրքորոշումը այս բանավեջի մեջ չի կանգնում են տեղ։ Եվ մնում պիլիսոպայության պաշտպանության սահմաններում համենային դեպս շատ ավելի շատ կան կան շատ ավելի կան սարտրի բարական։ Այսինքն կարող ենք մենք մերլոբորդի դեպքում խոսել պիլիսոպայության հաղթահարման, այս կամ այն դիպի հաղթահարման գաղափարի մասին, դրա դա անցնելու, կննադատելու, պիլ interesting question. I'm not sure about the answer. What I would say is more that it's another conception of, you know, of, of philosophy and of, the, of particularly on, of dialectics. In uh, Marxian, Hegelian, Marxian and uh, Sartre uh, dialectics, there's the idea that dialectic can have an end, that there is a synthesis possible. So that someone in the history of philosophy, in the history of thought, in, human history can have the final word, that the uh, opposite, that the opposing factors or, you know, actors of, of the dialectic, that it is possible to have a synthesis. And in Lalo-Ponti's, so this, in a sense, would be the end of philosophy. You have produced the dialectic, the synthesis of dialectics, and so, okay, there's nothing more to say. In this sense, it would be the end of philosophy. In this, it would, yeah. Um, but then, of course, it's not the end because you can always criticize this particular synthesis and propose another synthesis. But it's the conception of philosophy as potentially, uh, as a dialectic, pot potentially um, um, ending with a synthesis. And uh, Marabonti's conception of dialectics is a, is a dialectic, never, a never ending dialectic. He calls it hyperdialectic. The lect in his lectures, hyperdialectic, and it's a dialectics without synthesis. Because it's always in history, and history continues always. And because, and the main reason of this hyperdialectic is precisely because the actors of dialectics, those who, those who try and look and formulate it, they are themselves embodied in a situation and not and don't themselves access to any outside position that would enable that would yeah that would enable them to produce a final synthesis and so it's about it's always this interpretation of the embodied subject that's in, in, in the core of the question so I'd say it's not so much about overcoming philosophy it's more about conception of philosophy producing synthesis or not the opposition between the two. Now, hard to call on the other side. The other side is 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 the other side. Um, but I don't take this very much very seriously because Sartre abandoned uh, his his academic. Well, he, he would have access have had access to a, an academic career certainly after the war with no problems. But he didn't need to because he was selling lots of enough books. So and he was much much more free in that way to produce to produce whatever he he wanted. And Merleau-Ponty didn't have that freedom that, that Sartre had because he didn't write literature that didn't sell, and he didn't sell that, that well. So 
So it's more a pre-taste, I think, this, this idea. But of course, in there, uh, I should have read it again, but a few years, uh, read it many years ago, this correspondence between Sartre and Merleau-Ponty when they split, as they exchange a few letters, and uh, we talked about this with, with Barton, I don't really remember, but I remember one thing is, uh, one of the issues in this discussion was the choice made by Merleau-Ponty to pursue an academic career versus Sartre that would re remain free from the bourgeois institutions of academy, etc. So that, that's, that was one of the issues, but I really don't think it's the essential thing. Uh, Malmonti was really a guy who believed in the activity of philosophy, always renewing itself, always uh, in each new situation, it renews also the potential of philosophical questioning. And in that sense, it's a never ending story.